Good morning. My name is Cor. I'm on the pastoral staff here at Hope. And uh, summer brings a, a lot of traveling in and out. Uh, perhaps you are visiting with us this morning. Glad to have you. Uh, if you're new to Hope or just passing through, love, love meeting new people who are traveling uh, to and fro. Uh, we lose a lot of students that uh, return home for the summer, and it's cool just to meet uh, new people. And uh, I, I do want to give a, an update to those of you who are uh, consistently attending Hope. Uh, we are in the midst of a process that we've called Worship 3.0, uh, and maybe we haven't mentioned it from on stage. Um, <laughs> in a while. It's not because we haven't been talking about it. We have been talking about this at great length, and there's, there's three things that I'll uh, briefly mention this morning in regard to Worship 3.0. Uh, number one is just the process. So uh, our, our previous worship pastor transitioned away from Hope last August, and that kind of set us in a place to uh, reconsider and give prayerful attention to what do we want worship in the next um, era of life here at Hope to look like and sound like, and it went far beyond just the musical worship. It really kind of, you know, from the time you enter the, the sanctuary or really even kind of get to Hope on a Sunday morning from the time you leave, what do we want that experience to look like? And so uh, we've had um, upwards of 70 to 80 people that have been a part of this process, so uh, a good chunk of uh, staff and uh, leaders who have... Uh, whole church office here at Hope, and many lay people who serve, whether on a worship team or in various capacities, and so just trying to get a great cross-section of Hope. We've had multiple groups, groups that have as their focus uh, students, college students, uh, issues of race, preaching, music, uh, staff, elders, locations. We've really tried to attack it from many different angles, and now that it is uh, June, uh, it has been almost a year that we've been talking about this, praying about this. Um, out of that, out of all of those conversations and, and essentially uh, 10 months of, of prayer, uh, we brought forth 25 recommendations, of which I'm not gonna share any uh, with you this morning. <laughs> oh no, what is that? That's so mean. Uh, we will, we will uh, get that out to you. Uh, but another time, there, there's, there's some things that are uh, adjustments that we'll make that are uh, quicker, easier. It's just one Sunday it was this, and the next Sunday it's that. Uh, quite honestly, there are some, some um, great goals that we really believe God will need to do a work in us to change over a period of months and maybe even years uh, about who we want to become in order to fully embrace Christ in the midst of the culture that we live in and reaching the people of the Twin Cities, uh, we need to become a different people under, under God for that purpose. And so some of these don't happen. Like, hey, God, we want to be rid of sin. And then kind of between Sundays, we take care of that. And no, it's, there's, there's things that need to change in us. Um, God bringing us to a new place. So um, that's a little bit of the process. I am able to share that we are going to post tomorrow. We are going to post for the, the director of worship position. And so uh, what this means for you is not only have we kind of uh, reached out to the people of hope in the process and, and in order to get those, those recommendations, but we're reaching out to you uh, in this, in regard to this specific position. Uh, we would ask for you to uh, give consideration to who might be in your spheres who you might know that might be a fit for the director of worship position. Certainly we'd want you to go on and look at that posting and read through. Um, you know, just because my dad plays one song on the accordion does not mean he would be a good fit. Uh, so it can't just be like, oh, I know somebody who, you know, does the, does the harmonica on their side. You know, it's like, no, we, I mean, congregational worship. You're submitting this person to all of us, so let's be uh, wise about that, right? Um, but if you feel like you have uh, in mind a, a good candidate, somebody who'd be, um, you know, a possible fit for this, yes, encourage them to apply. Uh, we, d we do want to uh, consider a diverse and, and wide range um, of people for this, and yet realize that Olivia and me and Jordan and some of the other strategy team people are going to read through all these resumes. So, you know, uh, let's, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of a spectrum there uh, that, that you can help us with. Um, so, so be aware of that. And it's three weeks. 
We're going to open it up, and then after three weeks, shut it down and kind of take the next steps. And, and if God would allow a, a candidate that fits, that works, uh, that, that person could be in place, maybe by God's grace, by early August. So pray, 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 pray. Because <laughs> um, we'd love that, but we, we can't obviously manufacture this. We want it to be a spirit-led deal, and so we need, we need God's help. And so we would ask for you to um, be with us in this. Be with us in prayer and uh, be praying for the, the group. So mostly um, uh, the strategy team, which is me, Olivia, Natty, uh, Pastor Steve, and Pastor John, but then also... Um, people within the worship realm of uh, Jordan Anderson and Colin and Brendan, kind of that group of eight is really gonna carry a lot of weight in these next couple months. So please pray uh, for us and with us. I mean, this is exciting. Uh, third, this will be the third person we've ever hired in that, in that role in our 23-year history. So um, crazy to think about. With that, I just wanna pause right now and lift that up uh, to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is an exciting time to consider the changes that will come to Hope Community Church over the coming months. Um, with all of these recommendations, with all of these um, possibilities, we're, we're very excited. And yet, God, in all things, every change, every adjustment, every, every hire, every person uh, that is put in a leadership position, every small group that's created, Every person that is willing to serve in, in, in a very visible fashion or a very um, uh, kind of covered fashion throughout the, the church body, all of it, every person, every thought, every affection, every action, God, for your glory. May this not be about the glory of Hope Community Church, that the name of Hope or any one of its leaders would become well known, that this name of this director of worship would become well known, but no, Lord, that you, all the more, in these twin cities, would become famous, would become treasure, would become a source of salvation for those who don't know you, God. That's our hope as a church. That's our desire. Um, but God, we know that uh, with flesh and blood, this will fail only by your spirit, God. Um, the battle, the process, this summer, this hire belongs to you, and so help us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Keeping along the, uh, the, the, the P words here, we're gonna go with uh, preaching now. Um, so let's, uh, let's go to First Peter. Um, and we are uh, three messages from the, the, the completion of this sermon series. We are going to, um, the fourth Sunday in June, turn to summer questions. These are questions that you as a church have posed to the preaching staff, and we've been working that through and we're close to finalizing what those 10 topics are gonna be. Can't hit everything when uh, 32 different topics get uh, put forward. We can't do three every week. That just would be way too challenging uh, for you to listen to, uh, even though we, we might wanna try that, uh, preaching, uh, sharing all that. Um, but we've been in First Peter now for, uh, since the start of the year, and in the title of the series, Between Two Worlds, what's communicated there is we live in a world that we can see, taste things, touch things, that we move around in, and yet God speaks often in his word about a different world, a coming world, a world that is begun in some small fashion in, 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 in tangible ways, and yet will reach its fulfillment. We only get bits and pieces, we get tastes, we get rumblings, but the great earthquake is still awaits us. It, we will get there when all things are made new, just uh, was part of a funeral yesterday on this stage talking about that next world, Wendell, in that next world, just boom, in a moment, faith becomes sight. And he's launched into the presence of God. And one day God will wipe away every tear from our eyes that there will be no more death or mourning or pain. Because the old order of things, the old world, the current world will pass away and behold the new will be all that remains. No more sin. No more death. And so this book, this letter is written to a group of displaced people, a, a traveling people, an immigrant population, you might call them, who have been moved around and now they've resettled along some natives and Peter has called them a displaced or a dispersed people and is trying to encourage them. 
between two worlds about what they might be experiencing. And so I think it's very appropriate for us who might be experiencing some of the challenges, whether it's in relationships or in your workspace. You might go into culture or into the uh, public square or in political discourse and just feel like, wow, it's such a challenge to live for Christ in this realm. How do I do that? How do I do that well? Well, that's what we've been talking about for the past several months. Let me read a quote from St. Augustine, uh, kind of an early church father that wrote, wrote so many rich theological pieces here. Listen to what he says in regard to our upcoming passage for today. He says, because it is necessary to be loved and feared by men, that means kind of in our world that we live in, on account of certain functions in human society, the adversary, the devil, the enemy of our true happiness keeps urging and spreading this word. Well done, well done among his snares for us. The purpose is that while we are greedily gathering them in, we may be caught in our carelessness and put our joy far from thy truth and in the fallacies of men, that we may be pleased at being loved and feared, not on account of thee, not on account of God, but in place of God. And that's a warning, that's a challenge that is going to come forth in our reading for today from 1 Peter. Let me just recap one, just way back to the start of the letter of where this letter began is praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Why do I go back? Why do I share this? This is the only one I'm gonna share from a recap standpoint. Why do I share this one? because it's abundantly clear from the start of the letter and all throughout, this is not about you. This is not about me. This letter, okay, written to a group of people was ultimately not so that they would feel great about themselves, but that they would turn to God. Why, why do I see that in this passage? It says, you've been born again. When you think about your birth, you had Nothing to do with it, right? And the spiritual truth is comparable. In regard to your spiritual rebirth, that you're born again to a living hope, you had nothing to do with it. It's not because you were just brilliant where other people aren't. It's not that you're better looking and so God's like, oh yeah, I want the good looking kind that be a part of my family. That's, no, this is not about you, but about God's work in the world. You've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. God did something. Jesus did something that you and I couldn't do. We're bringing forth life out of death. We can't do that, friends. We can't manufacture that. That's only something that God does, and he does so when he saves. We're all spiritually dead in our sins, and God brings forth new life. You're born again to a living hope. And it says this inheritance is kept in heaven for us, and it will be revealed we get some benefit, some blessing, but so much more, friends, so much more. And it's, and it's that anticipation that drives us forward in our day-to-day. -day. It says that zeal, that joy that we have in God and what awaits us that we can say, all right, now the task at hand. All right, now the challenges that we're gonna come across. I mean, if you and I were just to sit and list out the challenges and problems and struggles and, and temptations and sin that you have just day-to-day, -day, I mean, we'd meet together for weeks before we Get through the list just in this room, right? God says, you've been born again to a living hope. Set your sight on things above. What is unseen is eternal. What is seen, what you're experiencing day and day, temporary. Let me carry you through that. Let me help you through that. Let me jump ahead now to today's passage where it says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's it. So, let's walk this through. One of the over, overwhelming pieces to this that I, I want us to be aware of, okay? I mentioned in, in the St. Augustine quote, 
There's this temptation in you and me every day, moment by moment, okay, to listen to the world and what the world says and let that ring loudly in our ears, resonate deeply within us and start to believe and trust those words rather than to trust God's word. That's the temptation for you and for me, that we will come across things in our world and think that's what's real, that's what's true, that's what's noble, that's what's holy. And in the midst of that, we might miss God's word. And Augustine references this adversary who wants to keep us happy. Well done, good job. You're so great. As you enslave yourself to your boss, you become that company person, oh, you're so great. And we might be losing our faith in the meantime, casting it aside, saying it really doesn't have a place in the public square, it really doesn't have a place in this office. I have to become someone who I'm not to appease my employer. So I want to highlight not just the fact that there's this adversary, not just the fact that we have a temptation to exchange what they're saying out there for, for God's word, but I also wanna say, how are we even solving this problem? If this is a problem, how are we even solving? Because what I see often, even in the church, is that we put human solutions to God-sized problems. We bring forth human solutions to God-sized problems. And I think this passage is gonna help us hopefully remedy that by the time we're done. So, going back to the start, it says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Now, this goes back to the previous four verses, okay? where Peter is going to come into this group, this kind of newly formed group of people and say, hey, I know you're a displaced people. I know you might not have a very well-established church. So those older among you, will you step up and will you bring forth some leadership? Will you do some organization? Will you be an example to those who are, will you do that? Will you shepherd well, okay? And in the same way that he said, like, hey, I need to organize some things amongst you, Peter says that. In the same way, now I want to address those who are younger. And I want to say, will you come under that leadership? Will you submit yourself to the elders? We talked in, at length in a previous message about this word submit, okay? Uh, this is something that we have uh, a choice, whether we're going to do this or not. And Peter says, hey, you are younger. It's going to help organizationally. It's going to help benefit this community, this, this kind of newly formed, displaced community. It's going to help if you're willing to submit yourself to your elders. Those elders could be just older people who are examples in the faith. It could be actually formal church leaders, elders. Same way, you are younger, will you do that? And that's the immediate context, okay, of this passage. And I understand the challenge. If we're just to immediately apply this in our context, the challenge. This idea of like, okay, I serve as an elder at Hope. Then I come to, to you and I say, hey, Bible says, got to submit to me. <laughs> like, that, right? I, even as I was talking through the worship 3.0 process, I'm guessing there's something maybe that stirred in you of like, oh, I kind of would have liked to have been a part of that. I kind of would have liked to have my two cents get in there, right? Like, that's... We've been taught within kind of an American democracy, I get my vote, I get my say, and worship 3.0 hap, it's kind of already done, and there's recommendation, I didn't even, uh, that's a challenge. As you come into community, to bring yourself under someone else's leadership. And if you've done that with any length of time, in any place, church, non-church, it's likely you've been hurt, you've been stung by bad leadership, leadership that has taken advantage of you giving your trust, giving your time, giving your effort, giving your love, and you're taken advantage of. You feel unseen and unheard in that midst. Friends, it happens here, here, in hope. Some of you have been at hope uh, so shortly that you, you think this is a perfect church and it's just not. This is where those of you have been around for a while, you laugh. You're like, oh man, if only they knew, right? I might be sharing this right here, and you may have a personal experience with me where you felt hurt because you did this toward me, and I 
hurt you. I wronged you. I, I trust the court, and then he did this, and it's really hard to trust what he says as he gets up there and preaches or as he leads. We're going to come back to this because God is readily aware of that dynamic, and I'm thankful that God is readily aware of that dynamic that exists. When he establishes somebody and says, hey, be a leader, and then to another group, hey, come under that leadership, and all the potential there is for breakdown. But he doesn't just leave it in this dynamic. He says then, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Throughout God's book, we learn of the importance of humility when it comes to uh, human community. It takes a lot to be in community with one another. Now, this is where, for me, so many sermons, so many messages stop, okay? All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Is that biblical? Yes, I just read it from the Bible. Okay? But if you stop reading, it stays at a very human level. Okay? And this is where I just want to uh, do a short aside that I think is vital to reading this passage correctly. Okay? And I want to compare anthropocentric reading versus theocentric. Those are just words. Okay? Centric, centered on, anthro. Anthropology, human, centered on humans versus centric on theo, theos, God, theology, study of God, right? Centered on God. And I think if we stop reading the passage, we will look at this and say, you know what? This is about me. This is about how I can be humble. When I go to my small group or when I go into my workspace, I just have to muster up humility because God said so, okay? Okay? And I think that's a, a poor reading. Now, I, I actually think that's an anthropocentric reading of the text. And I went on the online to get the definition. This is regarding humankind as a central or most important element. And as, as Christian people, we can't say that you and I are the most important. I don't think you can read through God's word and come away with saying, you know what, I'm kind of a big deal. I think that's a misreading of God's story. From beginning to end, it's about God. In the beginning, God, right? A couple, a few weeks ago, I talked about who's at the end. Jesus is in the end. And God shows up everywhere in between. And you and I, what, how we're described in Scripture is we're like the morning dew. We're just this vapor that's there for a moment and then the rest of the day happens without us. So, what does this look like? Let me give you an example from Scripture before I kind of really hit this head on, okay? Just an example of how you might see two people pray, one with that, that human-centered uh, understanding and another praying with more of a God-centered understanding, okay? Look what it says in Luke 18, a, a prayer of the human-centered or the anthropocentric. To some who are confident of their own righteousness... And look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to a temple to pray. One a Pharisee, a religious leader, and the other a tax collector, sinner, lowest of the low. The Pharisee, or religious leader, stood by himself and prayed this. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. That's a very human-centered, self-righteous prayer that Jesus sets up and says, here's the anti-type. This is a problem. And he grabs onto a Pharisee, a religious leader. It could say, a person from Hope Community Church stood by himself or herself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people like that person in my office, like that person on frat row, like that one I passed by on the street. I come to Hope on Sundays. I go to small group on Wednesdays. I give a tenth of all I get, right? It says, to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on other people, Jesus says, hey, beware of this type of thinking 
feeling, acting. And instead, he esteems, he lifts up the tax collector, the sinner. Said the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus says, this is, the, this is Jesus now giving the lesson. I tell you that this man, the tax collector, the sinner, rather than the Pharisee, the religious leader, went away justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Do you see the difference? The, the Pharisee, the religious leader, says, this is what I've done. The tax collector, the sinner, says, God, do something. God, show mercy. God, extend grace. God, help me. Do you see how one is very human-centered, very anthropocentric, and the other is theocentric? Now, why do I bring this up? Because this is where our passage goes now. We need to see the theocentricity of the passage. We need to see how God-centered it is, okay? Because it's not, oh, that little thing about humbling yourself is really not that important. No, 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 it's there. It's in our Bible. It's biblical. But here's the rationale. Here's the justification. It says, why do we do these things? God opposes the proud, shows favor to the humble. God opposes Pharisees, religious leaders, people of Hope Community Church that see in themselves a righteousness of their own, that hold themselves up as superior to the people around them, other people that you interact with, that I interact with day in and day out, that we feel this superiority. We're better than, why? Because we go to church. We're better than, why? Because we know truth of which they don't know. They're blind. Oh, I feel bad. They're just, they're so lost. But I see clearly. I know what's going on, right? God says, no, no, I, I pose that in you, hope. And I will show favor to the humble, to the one who says, God, help me. God, will you help me? Will you show me mercy? Will you give me grace? God, in my time of need, when I'm tempted on Friday, when I'm tempted come Monday morning, will you help me, God? God, I will be proud as I step forth from this building. Will you help me? Will you kill that in me? St. Jerome says, Think what a sin it must be which has God for its opponent. <laughs> How bad is pride? So bad that God says, I'm looking for someone who's a worthy opponent. Boom! I'm, I'm gonna oppose you, pride. I'm coming against you. Now, just to make this as clear as I possibly can because I, I feel like it's not just something that befalls kind of people out there. I, I really want to have this hit home with us, okay? And that's this, this anthropocentric error that's happening in our churches, in Hope Community Church, possibly, okay? Giving you the benefit of the doubt. But as preacher, I gotta, I gotta verify. <laughs> gotta validate, right? So this is what can often happen. Let's, let's say that the issue is, um, let's take money. Let's just take, take money, okay? There are ways by which churches relate to money that could be theocentric or anthropocentric. Could be God-centered or human-centered. Let me give you an example that I came across. This is a decade ago, and I'll update it as we go with some other examples. But probably about a decade ago, go to a conference, it's gonna be on generosity, okay? And one of the phrases that was shared at this conference was materialism, okay, is, is, a, is a sin. And so the antidote to materialism is generosity. Anybody see the problem with that? The antidote to materialism is generosity. The cure to materialism is generosity. Do you see why that's anthropocentric? I have this sin of materialism, which is something deep within me that sees money and says, mine, it's for me. I want it. I'm not gonna share it. Why? Because it's mine, okay? And what they're saying is, you have the ability 
to just open up your hands and be more generous with your money. Now, if we actually hold that material is a sin, there's one antidote to sin, Hope Community Church. One, Jesus. He's the only one that can help you and me with our sinful greed that says, me, mine, over you. I'm not gonna share with you, why? Because this is mine. I'm more important than you. I'm gonna keep this for myself. Only Jesus, only Jesus can forgive you of your sin, your selfishness, your greedy ways, okay? And my greedy ways, I got it too, okay? Only Jesus can help us with that. But go online and read the, right? God's antidote to materialism, generosity. Generosity is the antidote to material. God's antidote to materialism, generosity. Churches, we, we put out this. These are, these are our friends. This is our family, okay? And we're tempted to solve these theocentric problems with anthropocentric solutions. Just, no, 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 God problem better be a God solution. If materialism is a sin, Jesus better have died for it, or I am toast. This is not the only place where I see this happen. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about race. One of the most common ways, one of the commonest, most common anthropocentric ways to, to get out from underneath a charge of being racist is to say, I can't be racist. Why? I got a friend who's African American, right? The, the friend defense, right? This is, this is a New York Times article. The, some of my best friends are black defense, okay? That's an anthropocentric response to like the charge of racism. No, I got, I got a friend. So I can't possibly have sin of racism deep within me because I've done something to show that I'm, I'm not. It's like, if there should be any racism found in me, I need help from Jesus. And friends, because I grew up in this culture, there is in me. A seed of racism was planted in me, a seed of your superior was planted in me from a young age because I grew up in this culture. That was put in there. And I need Jesus to root it out. I need his help to get it out of me. If racism is not just a problem, but a sin, Jesus is the only antidote. Jesus is the only solution. Here's a comedic take on this same deal. If, if, it, if you're not buying what I'm selling, okay, this is how one British comedian posed it. I'm not a murderer. I can't be a murderer. Some of my best friends are alive. <laughs> right? That friends, the only defense I have in regard to racism is, Jesus, will you forgive me? Jesus, will you help me? Holy Spirit, will you come and unroot that? One of the, the great pains uh, in my trip to Washington, D.C. was how so much superiority is bound up in our past. Actually documented, right? We simultaneously in our documents are saying, we believe these truths are self-evident that all are created equal. And yet in the same breath, superiority and inferiority are defined. One group is set above the other. This is one that caught my attention because I didn't know much uh, about it in regard to uh, uh, our political engagement with Native Americans. It said, in the 1830s, the U.S. government forced Eastern Indian tribes to resettle in the West. I've shared this quote with several of you this week. This is how President Andrew Jackson put it in 1830. Removal from East inward to the West will separate Indians from immediate contact with the resettlement of whites, free them from the power of the states, hmm. enable them to pursue happiness in their own way, and to cast off their savage habits and become an interesting, civilized, and Christian community.
I need Jesus. We need Jesus. For those of you that grew up in this culture, it was baked into you from a young age. You are superior. You are superior. Coming back to the topic at hand, I even want to politely disagree with C.S. Lewis. The line to talk after the service will form here. (laughs) What did he say? Well, about humility and, and this idea of pride, he says, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. And from a human center, an anthropocentric starting point, I can say, okay. But that fails the test of theocentricity, right? I want to be Godward in my thoughts. I want God to help me. I need God to save me from pride. It's not just I see pride and so the solution is I'll just be humble. I can't. You can't. We can't. God opposes pride in me, in you, and in the apostles. Remember this account with Peter? Peter's trying to bring forth the plans that he believes God wants What happens? It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord! This shall never happen to you, he said. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. When we read the scriptures with a God-centered view of it, do you hear how bad pride is? God says to you and me, in our pride, right? Get behind me, Satan. He doesn't say, oh, we'll just, we'll just, Tomorrow, I'll try to be a little bit more humble. It's, no, our pride is offensive to God. He says to maybe his number one, foremost apostle, says, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God. You have human thinking. We've recounted many times Peter's need for Christ. This is a thread that runs throughout Scripture. Not able to recite all the passages. But many times Jesus talks about the Son of Man coming not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. If you want to be great, make yourself last. If you want to be first, be the servant of all. Different part of Matthew, it says, the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And as we read this again, we might be tempted to think, he's talking about me, I can be humble enough. And it's, friends, it's only when we get through the gospel into Jesus' death and resurrection, into the teaching of Philippians 2, that we really have this crystallized. That this is not about you and me becoming more humble, but what God has done. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through Christ. What did Christ do? Philippians 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him in the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should uh, should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you hear that? We can read through And we can hear this charge, humble yourself, humble yourself and think, okay, I can do it. It's only when we try and we fail. We say, God, have mercy on me. God, help me, a sinner. I can't. I wake up and I have pride and ego, envy, rivalry, selfish ambition, vain conceit. 
Every morning I wake up and I just have the perspective of me. Why? Because I opened my eyes. And from that, from that very moment, I'm at a disadvantage because I'm only thinking about myself, only what core sees, only what core experiences, only what I hear. Same with you. Then we come to Philippians 2, and it is salvation for us. Why? Because there is one who humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore, the one who's humbled God exalts not so much you and me, but this is so much more about Christ, what the Father has done with the Son. Where are we here? At the time of Jesus, every knee would bow. Every tongue confesses that where you're at this morning. There's a very religious way to respond to this. Very religious, very human-centered. God, I went to church. I gave to hope. I served on a team. It's part of a small group. Friends, you're tempted to do this every day, every week, to make it about what you did rather than what Christ has done. If we have a theocentric, a God-centered view of this, we come now and we read these verses differently. Humble yourselves, how? Under God's mighty hand, with God's grace, with Jesus' provision, his death, taking your pride, and yes, in due time, he will lift you up, whether that means specifically in a moment or whether it means one time for all time at the end of all things. Humble yourself. Why? How do we do that? Bow your knee. Confess with your mouth, God, I'm a sinner. I need your help. And then verse seven, I know it's often used in so many different contexts. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Right? And it's not wrong to use it in those contexts, but think about it in context here. As you humble yourself, as you come into community, as you come into hope, as you come into your workspace and you're underneath another leader, that's gonna cause all sorts of anxiety potentially. Will you cast that upon Christ who cares for you? Now, what does this look for us? Look, look like for us? I wanna hit it from two, two spots, both from hope, us as a church, but also for you as you go about your week. Let me give you a couple ideas of what this could look like. Worship 3.0, what does it look like for us in response to these verses? I'm really appreciative for the leadership, for the, for the elders, for the staff who've taken time to try to hear, to ask for help, whether that is in the last 10 months or even now, asking for your help over the coming three weeks, asking help as you solicit and, and bring forth names, as you pray for us. I think what I see in the leaders here is really healthy. I'm thankful for that. Are they perfect? No. Is there pride? Yes. Do we bring that to Jesus? Absolutely. But I'm really proud and excited and thankful for our leaders who I feel like have tried to listen well. What would those same leaders now share with the people of hope? How might you hear from the leaders as far as us as a community as, as going forward in, in a new age, in a new day, in this next season? Let me give you three things that you might consider. And yet, in pride, you might want to resist each of these. Why? Because you think you know better. And I get that. I understand that. But these are three things that our leaders would say, by far, this is going to help us as a church. Join a small group. How many times have you heard that from this stage? How many times, right? The importance of community. The importance of not going alone. We shared an informational video on how you can get connected to a small group. Be in small group. Does it have to be a hope one? No. Could it be? Yes. We'd love that. Two. Join my hope CC. Is that another platform? Yep. Is it something that I just, I'm going to have to check again? Yep. But I don't, I don't want to. Okay. We know. <laughs> we listened. We heard. This is one of those things in community that we would ask. 
Is it your right to not join? Yeah. Yep. Can't take that from you. Would it benefit our community? I think it would. And you're giving. Number three, last one. Team admin, team finance. Some of the best leaders we have in our church are in that realm. You know what's one way you could serve and bless and care well for this community? Next time you go online to do your giving, instead of hitting the one-time button, just make it regular. That seems like a lot of commitment, right? Like, ooh, that might bring some anxiety. We understand. In this, there are times where Jesus makes it easier on us and there's some times where Jesus makes it more difficult. These might be one of some of those difficult challenges. Yeah. As we talk as a staff, we, we love you guys and we care about you. And this, these three charges are not because, oh, this, will, this is just for the staff, this is just for the, the leaders. It's like, no, we really think that these three things could be highly beneficial to you in your life, in your faith. So as a church, those might be some church-wide things as we come into the next season. What, what might be some things that you can be doing this week? How about you try this? This is just, just one thing. Just try this. Because ultimately, we've talked about humbling yourself under elders, under leaders, humbling yourself amongst Christian community, but, but I want you to hear very clearly the importance of humbling yourself before God, coming underneath God. And here's how you might do that this week. Sit with him. Sit with him. Visualize the week you just came from and the week you're going into. Walk through your past week. And if you should find any pride in you, confess it. Share it with him. Say, God, I was wrong. I esteemed myself above that person. I showed myself as superior when I'm really not. Give it to him. Confess it. And then maybe you just walk through your coming week. God, help me. I have a tough meeting on Tuesday. Will you help me in that? God, I'm a sinner. And if I go into that meeting without your help, I will sin all over that person. Maybe all over my staff, right? So will you help me? I'm a sinner in need of mercy, in need of help. Will you help me? And what does it say? Cast all your anxiety upon him because what? He cares for you, Hope. If you hear nothing else today, do you hear that God cares about you? He is not against you. The cross screams his love for you. He is with you. He is for you. He loves you, and he cares about you. With that, we are going to come to the communion table. This is Jesus' body being broken for us and Jesus' blood being shed for us. That's that's what the experience of communion, taking the bread and taking the cup, reminds us. Jesus died for us to forgive, to save, to bring you into his family. And so when we do this, each uh, first Sunday of the month downtown and every Sunday at, at Lower Town. We as a community remind that, that we are led by not a pastor, but Jesus. Not by any leader here, but Christ leads us. And so you don't have to be a member of, of Hope Community Church or a member of any church. We do ask that you have bowed your knee to Christ, that you have confessed with your tongue that he is Savior and Lord of all. And if you haven't done that, you could do that this morning. Today is a great day to start a relationship with Christ, to come to him. That he might give you a living hope, an inheritance that can never be taken from you. At any point during the songs, feel free to avail yourself of the table. We have tables in the the front and back. I think we have a gluten-free option back to my right, your left, in the back. People be down front willing to pray for you. About anything going on in your life, it could be a, just ask for a general prayer or something specific. I'd love to pray for you. Let's pray together now as a community. Jesus, right now, um, amongst all the people of hope, we confess our need for you. We will not try to solve God problems with human solutions. That cross is our reminder that you've paid a debt, that you've taken our sin upon yourself, taken our pride upon yourself. May it perish the thought that we can fix ourselves, that we can clean ourselves up, that we can somehow rise from the dead ourselves. We can't. Only you, Jesus, make it possible. 
Convince us of that by your spirit. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.